Uh, dear colleagues uh, and friends from Ukraine, Bulgaria, uh, India, US, uh, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, today uh, we are going uh, to discuss a very important uh, issue, uh, such as uh, bibliometric and altmetric analysis uh, for researchers and uh, journals uh, editors. Uh, and we uh, hope uh, that knowledge gained uh, during today's uh, meeting uh, will transform uh, into advanced uh, academic activities uh, and uh, better uh, articles. Uh, I am very happy to introduce uh, our speakers, uh, Dr. Armen Gasparian, uh, Dr. Latika uh, Gupta, uh, and uh, Dr. Durga Misra. Uh, all of them uh, are highly skilled uh, journal uh, editors, uh, author, reviewers, clinicians, uh, with uh, numerous uh, articles uh, published uh, in indexed uh, medical uh, journals. Uh, now I am going uh, to switch from uh, English to Ukrainian for our Ukrainian participants. Uh, шановні колеги, вітаю вас uh, сьогодні в нашій віртуальній кімнаті. Uh, сьогодні ми продовжуємо uh, нашу серію uh, вебінарів, uh, основна мета яких uh, загалом покращити якість uh, наукових uh, публікацій. Як знаєте, минулого року ми провели загалом 13 uh, міжнародних uh, вебінарів. Були учасники з різних країн, і в цьому році ми проводимо вже другий вебінар. Перший вебінар ми проводили 5 січня, і він якраз був про те, як писати наукові статті англійською мовою. Сподіваюся, що подібний вебінар, але вже трішки в іншому аспекті, ми також організуємо найближчим часом і будемо продовжувати цю ініціативу для покращення англомовних навичок наших українських авторів. Так, в цьому нам допоможуть наші постійні спікерів і також лінгвісти. А сьогодні в нас дуже важлива тема, а саме застосування інструментів Altmetrics так, та проведення бібліометричного аналізу, який може бути застосований при виконанні наукового дослідження, так, і це може стати окремим параграфом вашої наукової дисертації. Особливо проведення альтметричного та бібліометричного аналізу актуальне в часи пандемії COVID-19, коли ми маємо обмежений доступ пацієнтів. І з одного боку це погано, а з другого боку добре, тому що це змусило нас отримувати нові знання, як застосовувати сучасні інтерактивні онлайн-технології для проведення свого наукового дослідження. Зокрема, мова йде про survey research, так, за допомогою твіттера cross-sectional study ми можемо зробити так для своєї дисертаційної роботи. Зараз я хочу запросити до також хочу запросити до слова нашого першого спікера, так, Армена Юрійовича Гаспаряна, який з 2007 року працює у Великобританії і є головним редактором журналу Rheumatology International, а також асоційованим редактором кількох впливових медичних журналів, зокрема Journal Korean of Medical Science. Армен Юрійович, доктор Армен, please. You can generously share with us your uh, rich uh, editors, uh, author and reviewers experience. <laughs> we are yeah. all awaiting for your uh, new presentation. Okay. Uh, yes, I have to uh, allow you uh, to share uh, your screen with us. Uh, just a moment. Yes, now you can do this. Шановні колеги, ще хочу додати, що всі вебінари з минулого року, а також сьогоднішній вебінар є записані, і ви можете їх подивитися у вільному доступі на нашому YouTube-каналі. Казахстан and India and US. So today we are going to discuss some uh, options for research, online research um, related to scientometric and altmetric uh, analysis. So it's something 
new for our uh, clinical specialists and uh, those who are not uh, uh, well uh, informed about uh, advanced bibliometric and altmetric tools. Today, I am going to discuss some of the newest options for research, comprehensive and systematic research involving complementary tools of scientometrics and altmetrics. So you probably all know that uh, we need to search through multidisciplinary and specialist bibliographic databases and also uh, to retrieve some items from digital libraries to write systematic reviews, narrative reviews, uh, standalone hypothesis, and also case-based reviews. So knowledge and skills of comprehensive and systematic searches via different reputable bibliographic databases are important in our times and particularly in the time of pandemic where we have to synthesize uh, evidence-based information, evidence-based uh, by analyzing primary sources. So uh, for most specialists worldwide, Web of Science core collection is um, a collection of databases that we need to employ for our daily practice as a researchers and to some extent as clinicians as well. Because clinical specialists also need to learn how to work with databases to uh, gather evidence-based information and then practice in line with uh, updated evidence-based information. So a Web of Science core collection is relatively new even uh, to special, it's uh, an understanding relatively new to specialists working with uh, information resor resources, databases. And um, the main idea of this collection is to distinguish uh, databases, two important databases for uh, citation analysis such as uh, Science Citation Index Expanded and Social Sciences Citation Index. These are two uh, important citation and abstract databases which contribute to impact factor of journals. So I have to uh, inform our participants that uh, Web of Science Core Collection is a collection of um, scientifically prestigious journals uh, that contribute to science growth. But you probably also know that not all specialists have the same citation culture, the same access to uh, bibliographic uh, uh, peer-reviewed journals. And this is why uh, Thomson Reuters and then uh, Clarivate Analytics considered uh, processing arts and humanities journals separately without calculation of impact factor. So arts and humanities citation index is a part of web of science, science, uh, science uh, core collection, but without uh, contribution to journal citation reports. Uh, each year uh, by mid June, we, uh, process data, process citations, and uh, Clarivate Analytics um, information uh, service provider, US-based information uh, service provider, calculates impact journal two year and other impact metrics of journals and publishes uh, journal citation reports, which is based on citations coming from science and social sciences collection. So, but we also know that uh, Web of Science platform processes journals from uh, a number of non-anglophone countries, countries uh, emerging scientific powers, and for mostly for them and mostly for startup journals, <clears throat> Web of Science <clears throat> introduced 
Emerging Sources Citation Index uh, in 2015. So, Emerging Sources Citation Index is again part of Web of Science Core Collection of great interest to East, uh, Eastern European, Central Asian uh, countries and in, uh, to countries where journals are gradually developing, advancing and competing to uh, Western journals or Anglophone journals. All other uh, Web of Science Core Collection uh, resources, particularly conference and uh, book citation indexes, uh, they are also important, but not as important as uh, pre uh, other mentioned databases. So for researchers uh, and editors, there are also other platforms of interest, particularly Scopus, we'll discuss so, uh, Scopus uh, in detail uh, in a bit, uh, a bit later. Also researchers, and journal editors need to know about directory of open access journals. It's now a platform of more than 15,000 open access journals uh, with uh, high quality uh, standards. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, startup journals are also planning to cover uh, their journals by Doge and then consider other databases, more advanced databases requiring uh, higher citation scores, citation metrics, and higher uh, quality of published items. For uh, developing countries, there is Hainari uh, library or service affiliated to WHO. It provides, it's a separate service for developing countries without lacking access to uh, bibliographic databases such as uh, or web of science platforms, Scopus, etc. So Hainari is primarily a uh, service of interest to developing countries. We are not going to discuss this service today because I'm sure most, our, most of our participants have access to Scopus and web of science and uh, use these databases regularly. Google Scholar is a digital platform search engine uh, again it's a well uh, established platform but with some uh, sp specific differences compared to reputable web of science uh, databases and scopus and dimension is a competitor to uh, so-called competitor to google scholar and other uh, search engines uh, the only difference is that uh, dimension is more focused on sources with digital object identifier. I'm sure that most journals in Eastern Europe, in uh, emerging science uh, countries, uh, most journals provide cross-ref uh, services to their uh, for tagging articles by digital object identifiers. And dimensions is a platform covering all uh, scientific articles tagged with digital object identifier. So for specialists who deal with bibliographic databases uh, or who uh, need access to bibliographic databases, uh, they need to know which databases more relate to their professional interests. Let's say biomedical specialists need Medline as a uh, as the main bibliographic uh, database, which is uh, covering, which covers evidence-based sources. And it's um, provided, it is provided on PubMed platform and also other platforms, but the uh, National Library of Medicine PubMed platform is uh, the most popular uh, platform, online platform for particularly for biomedical, biological and veterinary specialists. Biology is a service of Clarivate Analytics. It's a separate specialist database, not covered by a uh, web of science core collection, but still it's important for biology specialists. Agriculture uh, specialists need access to Agris and Agricola, particularly Agricola because Agricola is slightly more advanced uh, 
offers sophisticated uh, search uh, engine similar to uh, search engine of uh, employed by uh, PubMed. Chemistry specialists need chemical abstract service, and I am sure that pharmacology, pharmacy, toxicology specialists, and uh, medical specialists as well sometimes also need to search through chemical abstract service. Psychology, neurology, psychiatry specialists may benefit from searches via psych info. Uh, it's a specialist service um, with tough selection uh, criteria, quite similar to Medline selection criteria and uh, information specialists, library scientists, uh, communi communication specialists may uh, improve the vis visibility of their journals and articles by uh, integrating their uh, journal platforms with uh, LISA or LISTA specialist databases presented on uh, ProQuest and EBSCO information aggregators. So our specialists, researchers, and journal editors need to know the difference between bibliographic databases and information aggregators. So uh, among uh, uh, the latter, EBSCO services and ProQuest services are not uh, quite important. And I hope that countries in Eastern Europe uh, cooperate with both information aggregators. So sociology specialists also have their own specialist database, sociology abstracts, again, presented or uh, provided by ProQuest information aggregator. ProQuest is famous for uh, a number of databases, subs mostly subscription databases, and also uh, freely available dissertations uh, collection, PhD dissertation collections, collection. So we need to divide biomedical specialist, specialist services from uh, numerous other no, narrow specialized databases. Uh, Medline and um, to some extent Embase, except America, database, these two databases always stand, uh, stand separately because they cover large uh, number of uh, peer-reviewed biomedical journals. Medline covers uh, 5,500, almost 5,500 peer-reviewed medical journals covering evidence-based medicine. And uh, for most biomedical journals, it's uh, the tip or top level of the, uh, the highest level of development to be indexed by Medline. Many narrow specialists, let's say uh, gynecologists, uh, uh, need to uh, search through specialized databases such as Popline, uh, high, um, public health specialists, it, uh, epidemiologists, and um, health, public health administrators may need to access global health, UK-based information service. So there are a number of databases. And to distinguish these databases, we need to know to delve deeper into specifications of all these databases and to have knowledge about their search engines. So most of the time, we deal with uh, multidisciplinary bibliographic databases or platforms uh, like, uh, like Web of Science and Scopus. And we need to know what's the difference between these two well-organized databases uh, from uh, between databases and Google Scholar as a search engine. First of all, Scopus is uh, considered as a competitor of Web of Science uh, the databases uh, because it's rapidly developing uh, and covering um, more sources than Web of Science databases, particularly those uh, that contribute to uh, impact factors. So Scopus, there is evidence 
a rather old evidence that Scopus covers 20% more uh, journals than uh, Web of Science databases, particularly those two uh, highly reputable databases, Science Citation Index Expanded and Social Sciences Citation Index. Google Scholar, which is a uh, search engine, uh, was launched in uh, 2004, almost the same time as uh, uh, Scopus 2005, but Google Scholar was uh, launched as a search engine and their search engine or algorithm of searches directed towards traffic. So the more uh, articles are accessed, downloaded on their journal pl platforms, their uh, visibility or searchability increases on Google Scholar. Whereas on Web of Science on end Scopus, there is no difference, uh, uh, no such algorithm, page rank algorithm employed by Google Scholar. So Scopus is a reliable database considering keywords, but not downloadability or traffic of uh, uh, traffic of articles. So Scopus covers a wider journal range and it is database that uh, goes back historically to uh, period uh, well before 1995. Initially, in 2005, when it was launched, Scopus, it covered up to 1995. But uh, nowadays, uh, coverage, coverage by Scopus uh, is gradually expanding. And it's good news for well-established journals with a history spanning to decades and even centuries, like Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, Nature. So. Uh, there was also evidence of, of um, uh, science specific difference between search engine and uh, bibliographic databases a few years ago uh, and published evidence, their evidence data, uh, which allowed us to strictly distinguish Google Scholar from Web of Science and Scopus. Of course, Google Scholar as a search engine uh, capable of covering a large number of uh, peer reviewed sources. Uh, overlap between Google Scholar, Web of Science and Scopus is uh, almost 100, okay, 95%. But half of Google Scholar unique citations are not from peer-reviewed journals, which means that Google Scholar may cover also gray literature, non-peer-reviewed sources. And this is why uh, we cannot rely on uh, Google Scholar as a reliable peer-reviewed, uh, reliable platform for uh, evidence synthesis. So we need Web, uh, Web of Science and Scopus for our systematic reviews, uh, practice guidelines, and original research papers relying on evidence. Google Scholar uh, I, I, I've already mentioned that Google Scholar employs page rank algorithm and um, scientific uh, impact or in other words scientific prestige of uh, items covered by Sc Google Scholar is lower compared to particularly Web of Science. Web of Science is the most reputable source of peer-reviewed li literature, peer-reviewed sources, and uh, let's say US-based specialists uh, employ a Web of Science for their top evidence-based articles. European specialists, non-anglophone specialists more rely on Scopus because it covers a large number of non-anglophone sources and it may be even uh, its competitor to Web of Science and Scopus may help to cover uh, topics of interest to Eastern Europe, Central Asia, emerging scientific uh, powers. 
But there is also evidence, again, based on uh, latest publication by scientometric experts, that if we consider uh, collection of uh, the same peer-reviewed articles in Google Scholar, Web of Science, and Scopus citations uh, collected from each of these platforms uh, are associated. So if we see growth of citations on Google Scholar related to a collection of uh, articles, the same trend is expected to occur uh, in uh, Scopus and the Web of Science. And there was also another scientometric analysis of sources collection of articles, thousands of articles, where particularly uh, original research papers and reviews, where Web of Science, either Web of Science or Scopus was mentioned in their search strategies and other parts of articles. So evidence suggests that uh, coverage of these databases in uh, evidence-based articles or peer-reviewed articles is almost the same. And there is similar trends uh, in use in uh, mentioning these two multidisciplinary databases. It suggests that both Web of Science and Scopus can be used for evidence-based synthesis. But the same article also analyzed dynamics of using Web of Science, Blue Line, and uh, Scopus, Orange Line. And they concluded, authors concluded that in meta-analysis, systematic reviews with meta-analysis, Web of Science is mentioned uh, more compared to Scopus. Why is that? Because uh, most systematic reviews with meta-analysis, so quantitative systematic reviews come from China and Chinese specialists uh, use Web of Science for their systematic searches more than Scopus. Of course, they have to cover uh, Scopus as well because Scopus uh, covers more non-anglophone sources and uh, to some extent, it also covers more citations, more uh, emerging uh, or startup journals, and it can be also useful for systematic reviews. We also need to know about uh, Excerpta Medica database. It's traditional database, uh, proprietary service database of Elsevier uh, publisher, and it's again uh, one of the pre highly prestigious databases. Journals applying to Scopus for coverage may be considered for MBase coverage by uh, Scopus experts, uh, Elsevier uh, experts, but those who are sure that their journals relate to pharmacy, pharmacology, toxicology, veterinary medicine, or other uh, specialties related to drug therapies and uh, drug technologies can apply, journal, uh, journal publishers and editors can separately apply to Web of Science, uh, to Embase for indexing. So what's the difference between Embase and Medline? The difference is that Embase is a service bibliographic database of Elsevier, European publisher, whereas Medline is a service, is a database of National Library of Medicine of US. This is why there is uh, evidence suggesting that Medline covers more English sources or Medline co nowadays covers exclusively English sources, whereas Embase still covers uh, a large number of non-anglophone, Slavic and other journals. All researchers may benefit from Cochrane Library uh, databases. And these databases are essential for uh, evidence-based searches, for uh, clinical presentations, for uh, practice guidelines. There are a number 
of uh, platforms or databases covered by Cochrane Library. So those who are interested in uh, randomized clinical trials may go to central or Cochrane Central Register of Controlled Trials and check whether there is any uh, ongoing or accomplished trial covering drug therapies, medical technologies, etc. And particularly in the time of COVID-19, it's important to know which uh, trials are accomplished and which trials may present evidence on drug therapies or prevention for COVID-19. Uh, there is also another reputable and uh, large, huge database of Cochrane Library called Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews. We need to search Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews to retrieve information about, again, synthesized information about drug therapies, medical technologies. So clinical specialists need these two uh, large databases clinical trial databases and Cochrane databases. Cochrane databases covers a large number of uh, evidence-based systematic reviews and there are thousands of uh, systematic reviews. These systematic reviews are different from uh, ordinary or uh, so-called or other systematic reviews produced mostly uh, by Chinese by um, other emerging scientific uh, researchers of uh, emerging scientific powers. So we need to distinguish systematic reviews covered by Cochrane database and systematic reviews not covered by a Cochrane database of systematic reviews, because there is huge difference. Some of systematic reviews coming from China and other countries may be generated by computers without even human touch. So now about Scopus. Scopus is a multidisciplinary abstract and citation database and it's a, a desirable for peer reviewed journals to consider Scopus indexing as a target, as a goal of their development strategy, particularly in Eastern Europe and uh, in Central Asia, because number of journals, peer-reviewed journals covered by Web of Science in these regions is much low compared to their uh, counterparts in uh, Western world, in Western Europe and US. So we need to focus on Scopus services and we need to increase uh, quality and ethical standards of uh, non-anglophone journals or journals in Eastern Europe switching to English and these journals should be considered for Scopus indexing. Traditionally, uh, Scopus covers 100% of Medline index journals. So, of course, for systematic reviews, for comprehensive searches, it's important to have searches via Medline. But uh, Medline covers just 5,500 journals, whereas Scopus covers more than 25,000 uh, peer-reviewed periodicals, most, uh, journals. So we need to combine searches uh, with uh, by Medline with searches by Scopus to cover literature more comprehensively. Of course, not just medics, but also specialists in other fields, in uh, physical sciences, social sciences, sciences and humanities, life, um, life sciences, veterinary science may also benefit from uh, cover for in, from indexing by Scopus and uh, searches, Scopus searches, which are advantages of Scopus. Of course, it's largest citation and abstract database. If uh, you think about the, uh, your uh, search strategy, you first should think about Scopus, not Embase, Scopus. Scopus and Embase are uh, databases of Elsevier, the same uh, provider, the same uh, proprietor. However, Scopus is much larger compared to Embase. Embase is more uh, important, more relevant to pharmacology, pharmacy, and toxicology specialists, whereas Scopus covers uh, 
disciplines related to many other fields, subject categories, a number of subject categories. 25 subjects, subject uh, categories are covered by Scopus. It's considered as a large non-anglophone source of information and university, university rankings worldwide depends on Scopus profiles. So uh, you may increase rank of your university in Kharkiv, in uh, Vinica, uh, uh, in Lviv, Sofia, Varna, Plovdiv, uh, Aktobe, by increasing number of publications visible on Scopus. Scopus journal selection criteria for publishers and journal editors are well established, uh, nothing new. Simply, you should pay attention to quality of English language of your abstracts. So abstracts should be readable, particularly to non-experts, to a wider audience. You should establish, uh, you should stick to regular schedule of publication, no delays, no, uh, uh, no dis uh, disrupted publication. So regular publication is uh, the one of the uh, critical uh, criteria of indexing by Scopus. Editorial policy and established peer review. I know, I am well aware that peer review is deficient uh, across most uh, Eastern European, Central, Central Asian and uh, in countries of these regions. So you should pay attention to peer review and you should credit your reviewers properly, particularly on uh, Pablon's platform. Publication ethics and publication malpractice statements. If you pay attention to quality and ethics of your publications, you may increase indexability of your journals. I know that um, a number of Eastern European journal editors wish to see their journals covered by Scopus and within two to five years, it's possible uh, after uh, starting or after switching to uh, best standards, publication uh, standards. References, of course, should be in Roman script, uh, not in uh, Cyrillic, not in other scripts. So, but my uh, approach to this point is, or, or this criterion is to cover sources from databases, Scopus, Web of Science, PubMed, and you will, you will have quality reference list in uh, articles of your journals. And again, indexability of your journals will increase. Uh, Scopus experts uh, have a detailed selection uh, strategy related to journal policy. It should be convincing policy uh, with aims, specific aims and uh, scope, content coverage, related, strictly related to a specific subject category. When you apply to Scopus indexing, you should know which subject categories strictly relate to your journal. If it's general med medicine, it's okay, but you should also think about some subspecialties like uh, rheumatology, like orthopedics, uh, like endocrinology, or you should know which are uh, journal competitors already covered by Scopus and how you may compete, how you may uh, add new value by uh, indexing your journal by Scopus. So citedness is also important, but there is one uh, important point um, or message, okay, message to Eastern European uh, journal editors. If your journal uh, is uh, developing and citation rates are ethically increasing, citation counts are ethically increasing, reasonably increasing, you may satisfy Scopus uh, these particular criteria. If you, uh, an editor of journal and your journal is published over the past 20, 30 years, and citation counts are too low or close to zero, indexability or coverage by Scopus is uh, 
unlikely. So be very careful and know how to increase citation counts of uh, your journal journals ethically without citation stacking, without organizing cartels of citations and asking your friendly journals or publishers to uh, abundantly cite your articles. Some of the index journals are delisted because of citation games, because of citation stackings, and uh, also because of citation games. So cite only relevant items and encourage your specialists also cite relevant uh, and ethical uh, articles only without any artificial uh, boost of citations. Regularity is also important. So if your journal is quarterly, you should have a well-established uh, timeline of publication without major delays. Delays always are treated badly. And especially if you declare uh, your timeline, timeline in your instructions for authors and aims and uh, scope of your journal. And uh, finally, online availability is important. I know that Open Science in Ukraine is one of the best uh, repositories of and one of the best providers of uh, journal uh, platforms in Eastern Europe. And I strongly encourage all our today's participants to follow progress on Open Science in Ukraine platform because they cover uh, the best sources in Eastern Europe, particularly in Ukraine. So, but there are also journals from other countries, particularly from Kazakhstan. So I hope that all journals uh, with uh, quality items will consider also uh, online availab availability of their journals and also consider advancing their online availability, integration with a number of online tools, social media plugins to increase visibility and dissemination of information of your journals. You probably know that Scopus is, uh, or Elsevier covers not just Scopus, but also Plamex uh, social media aggregator and presents, displays information about article, about citations, along with social media coverage. So Scopus and Elsevier value high these uh, scientometric and automatic information related to individual articles. Now, those who are going to perform systematic and comprehensive searches in their narrative reviews and systematic reviews should memorize these tips of searches via Scopus. Why it's important? Because if you uh, master Scopus searches, you will retrieve relevant articles for your uh, articles for your presentations and other scholarly items, practice guidelines, and you will produce a reliable uh, research outputs. First of all, all our participants, all researchers, authors need to know where to find professional keywords related to their field of interest. Medics, veterinary scientists, uh, and allied specialists employ medical subject heading keywords or MESH keywords present uh, displayed on National, of, National Library of Medicine, American uh, Library, National Library of Medicine platform. So MESH keywords are important for medics, but uh, other specialists, let's say specialists uh, from pharmacy, pharmacology fields may benefit also from M-based keywords presented on Scopus search platform. So um, keyword for keywords uh, vocabulary for uh, medical uh, pharmacy pharmacology specialist is called, it's called Excerpta Medica 3, EM3. So there are a variety of keywords, professional keywords, and uh, some may benefit uh, from these keywords, particularly when they search through Scopus. But if there is no, 
established vocabulary, let's say in art, in humanities and in uh, emerging disciplines, specialists may use logical keywords, which are logical keywords. So let's say for today's presentation, I may use social media as, a, as an established mesh keyword. But if I uh, want to search something uh, more related to uh, altmetric searches, I may use altmetrics as logical word because there is no keyword such as altmetric in mesh vocabulary. Second point, uh, all those who search through Scopus, uh, they need to know how many articles are indexed by Scopus and tagged with uh, that specific keyword. Let's say social media, when we use social media as a search keyword, we need, first of all, to establish number of articles with these keywords. We may rank articles, Scopus articles, based on their citation counts, descending, present these articles in descending order, and then pay closer attention to top 5, 10, 50, or 100 articles. Today's uh, keynote sp uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Misra, will talk about highly cited articles why we need to know about highly cited articles. So Scopus, Scopus database allows us to analyze information about highly cited articles. <clears throat> and these articles are important to map our academic discipline, to know which articles contributed to science growth uh, most. In some disciplines, Let's say mostly in arts and humanities, the number of citations is relatively low and we may uh, limit our searches of highly cited articles to 50, to 30, 20, it depends on academic disciplines. But in most rapidly developing uh, academic disciplines like rheumatology, immunology, particularly immunology is well advanced and uh, well established disciplines with, an, uh, with hundreds of peer-reviewed journals and their citation classics should involve 100, uh, top 100 highly cited articles. We may also visualize annual publication activity based on Scopus. You probably also know that the same activity is displayed on PubMed or National Library of Medicine searches. We may visualize top journals covering specifically target, uh, tagged uh, articles. Then we may pay attention to top five or 10 uh, authors in the field. It, uh, it again depends on academic discipline. In immunology, rheumatology, number of uh, our uh, researchers and authors is relatively high. So we may need, sometimes we may even need not just 10, but also 20 or even more top art, uh, authors publishing in this field. Whereas in arts and humanities, in nursing and other uh, start or um, ongoing academic disciplines, we may limit our interest to top three, five, 10 authors. Again, we may also map top institutions, top countries in the field of interest, uh, identify in uh, uh, percentages the most important disciplines, and we may also analyze keywords associations. So you will see in the next few slides how we process information about keywords and how we may use these keywords, uh, numbers of keywords to synthesize information, new information. So let's start searching alt metrics as a logical word, as a uh, new, relatively new uh, professional word for our searches. It's an example. Any specialist may use another 
any other uh, keyword or logical word and experiment or play with Scopus the same way. So you see, uh, my first step is to establish number of articles related to this uh, word. More than five, 870 articles are tagged in their title, abstract and keyword by Altmetrics word. So it's relatively small number of articles because Altmetrics is relatively new field of interest. So number of articles is relatively low. So we may now uh, organize articles uh, in Scopus based on their citation counts in descending order and uh, analyze top few articles related to this keyword. So you see also another tool allowing us to uh, draw this impressive line suggesting how annual publication activity changes from year to year. So you see that Altmetrics is introduced uh, in 2012. So almost in the time of uh, establishing uh, social media aggregators and over the past nine, 10 years, publication activity related to Altmetrics is increasing. So the tip point is 150 articles in uh, 2019. Uh, and this number will probably go up in the coming few years. So it's uh, just snapshot analysis, so cross-sectional analysis. So this is why you see such a uh, unusual line, but uh, most uh, important from this graph is that publication, there is trend that publication activity related to altmetrics is increases. So our researchers also need to know that it's, that it's a, a hot field of interest and they may deep, uh, delve deeper into this field to uh, enrich their searches, enrich their dissertations, and also understand why altmetrics tools are gaining momentum, particularly in the time of pandemic when online research is everything for us. So we may also pay attention to top sources, uh, top sources related to altmetrics, relate to scientometrics. It's one of the leading scientific journals, peer reviewed journals published by Springer. And I am one of uh, peer reviewers of this journal. And scientometrics, uh, considers uh, not just old metrics, but also bibliometric analysis and emerging fields uh, related to online attention. So another graph can be used based on scope of searches uh, to visualize which are top five or top 10 journals covering altmetrics. You see that uh, some of these journals closely relate to citation analysis, but there is also general medical, uh, general uh, scientific journals like PLOS One, Public Library of Science One, uh, which is a multidisciplinary scientific journals, not just medical, but also non-medical fields also presented on uh, PLOS One. Uh, Scopus searches allow us, and we should rely on this information to visualize top 10, top 20 scientists uh, publishing in this field. Uh, affiliations also presented by Scopus. And again, it's important, uh, valuable source of information, particularly for uh, PhD candidates who wish to uh, uh, undertake their research in a specific laboratory or in a specific university of their interest. Uh, countries involved in altmetrics. Of course, we may pay attention to top 10, 20, 30 countries, but we may also pay attention how uh, regional countries or ongoing uh, or scientific powers are related to altmetrics. Let's say only two articles from Ukraine relate to altmetrics. It's just and uh, 
in Scopus, particularly in Scopus. But I am sure that scientists in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, will strive to cover more, to work more on altmetrics and uh, have advance, have a um, breakthrough in this direction. So an pie graph is important to visualize which subject, which uh, subject areas closely uh, well um, covered by uh, altmetrics articles. Of course, medicine is one of the uh, most important fields of uh, uh, field uh, area, scientific area. However, sociology and computer science more relate to altmetrics. So online research, uh, bibliometrics, altmetrics closely relate to sociology, surveys, uh, public opinion and computer science, because computer science and uh, online uh, information technologies allow us to improve altmetric analysis. We'll discuss some of information aggregators and you will see that those information aggregators uh, equipped with advanced uh, online uh, tools provide more reliable information, more comprehensive information, and we of course, need IT skills uh, among our collaborators to have more reliable research, more comprehensive research. So now about keywords analysis, uh, particularly related to altmetrics. Those of you who are going to use various, various cloud-based software may analyze uh, and visualize which keywords more relate to altmetrics. You see, I manually uh, singled out uh, keywords of importance. So you see that altmetrics, social media, bibliometrics are top keywords related to altmetrics, but there are also periodicals as keyword, mesh keywords related to altmetrics. So you may uh, calculate percentages and present table. Uh, and in that table, present top 10, uh, top 20 most important keywords related to altmetrics. But you may also use more sophisticated techniques, cloud based techniques, and your computer scientists, IT specialists, may help you to analyze these data and produce clouds of um, information. And the larger rings, the more important is keyword, more relate, more it relate to uh, altmetrics. So, of course, those who are going to work uh, with uh, scientometrics and altmetrics, they need to know about software. Without uh, free or uh, paid software, it's difficult to process uh, big data. Of course, it's you work if you work in a field where uh, you are interested and you are interested in altmetrics. Of course, there are just thousand articles. You may manually analyze this information. However, if you deal with a field where uh, instead of altmetrics, instead of uh, new keyword, new logical word, you deal with well-established keywords related to thousands. Tens, and, uh, tens of thousands of keywords, you need software. And these are just examples of software helping you to improve your scientometric, bibliometric and altmetric analysis, particularly knowledge matrix. It's a Korean uh, software, proprietary software, uh, Korea, South Korean service. Mo there is also European service, was viewer, uh, by uh, Leiden University. Uh, it's again proprietary service and you may use these, uh, these particular software for cloud-based analysis. Again, for altmetric and scientometric and any other uh, information analysis uh, consuming big data. So you see here, I present some of the examples of searches and publications related uh, based on visualization software. So here is an, an example of co-citation sources. Uh, 
published uh, a few years back, ago, and it allows to visualize which journals co-cite, which journals are uh, relate to each other in terms of their citations. So this type of uh, citation analysis, co-citation analysis may also uh, bring new information. Another software, again, uh, published by the same author team uh, in another journal, other software may allow to visualize hot spots, red spots, more uh, hot spots of great importance, uh, hot spots uh, based on large number of citations or other large number of keywords. So these are software based analysis. Of course, for these type of analysis, uh, these type of analysis are based on a large number of primary items, primary sources. So now why we need to combine bibliometrics with alt, with alt metrics? Because uh, an article published in Nature in 2013 already uh, highlighted uh, the importance of combining social media information with citation counts. And for academics, for journals, it's also uh, important to have not just citations, not just uh, activity aimed to attract more citations, but also activity aimed to attract more social media attention. And nowadays, over the past 10, seven, 10 years, information aggregators improved and allowed us to cover both citations and uh, social media attentions, attention, which are complementary, complementary activities, complementary sources of information. We analyzed re recently a number of social media platforms. I know that uh, some or most of you will use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube for your scholarly activities, Mendeley, for your PhD dissertations and uh, for organizing your personal libraries for networking and uh, contributing to altmetric analysis. But also ResearchGate is considered as social networking or social media platform. Uh, but uh, the main purpose of ResearchGate is to increase visibility of PDF of articles not covered by uh, well-established repositories. ResearchGate is one of the important platforms in Eastern Europe and emerging scientific powers because in the, uh, these regions are not well represented by PubMed Central and other prestigious uh, repositories. So ResearchGate may increase visibility of articles in line with copyright uh, regulations. So cross-sectional altmetric analysis. We discuss uh, uh, importance of cross-sectional analysis and we discuss advantages and limitations of cross-sectional analysis. So we need to establish for our cross-sectional analysis timeline, which, is, which should be strict beginning and end of our analysis. And we should also uh, select, carefully select, articles of interest. So inclusion and exclusion criteria should be uh, highly selective for our cross-sectional scientometric or bibliometric and altmetric analysis. We need to choose information aggregator for our altmetric analysis. There are few uh, established information aggregators presented below but not all, not, uh, all of them are equal. Uh, they have uh, differences. So we need to reveal, reveal altmetric profile of each article. And for that, for that, remember, we need altmetric it tool. Or those who have full access to altmetric.com or other information aggregators may process big data. So always we need to compare altmetric analysis with citations 
because citations are considered as hard currency of academic activities. So we always compare altmetric activities, altmetric profile of individual articles with their citation profiles, citation counts. So now about difference between three established info, uh, social media aggregators. Uh, it's my personal opinion uh, that Altmetrics is uh, one of the best aggregators of social media attention. Why? Because all, uh, when uh, empirically, when I search different articles and uh, compare, let's say, Altmetrics with uh, Plum, Plumex analytics uh, data, I see that most of the time Altmetrics covers more sources more information compared to Plumex. Know any information about our research, which is uh, 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 formerly known as uh, impact story information, uh, social media aggregator, it's relatively new, relatively, um, de uh, it's developing uh, information aggregator, aggregator of social media attention. So. My advice, my personal advice is to stick to altmetrics.com for a while. And there is, of course, I know about evidence comparing these uh, you know, uh, aggregators of social media. And there is evidence that altmetrics provide more reliable information. But uh, Plumex is aggregated with uh, Elsevier publisher and they also claim that their information is reliable. And this is why on Scopus, uh, platform, you may see citations uh, in connection with Plum print or Plum analytics data of social media attention. So there are uh, several tools from altmetric.com and these tools should be used by advanced researchers, those who are uh, specializing in altmetric analysis. For most other specialists, altmetric it tool is enough. Now, some examples of uh, analysis. We see social media on uh, Scopus and we see a uh, number of uh, items covered by Scopus, huge number. So social media is more established uh, keyword. It's a keyword uh, linked to mesh vocabulary. And when we see, let's say top article tagged with social media keyword, and we analyze this uh, keyword, we see high number of citations and we see information from Plum Print. Again, uh, different uh, rings uh, presented in different colors. And we see uh, information from this Plum Print. Most of the time, tweets are contributing mostly to print, uh, pr uh, Plum Print, the same with uh, uh, donut ring of altmetric.com, altmetric uh, um, alternative uh, attention score, AAS. So uh, the, these top cited article can be uh, analyzed in view of social media attention uh, across some across countries. And we see that most of the time, uh, US based specialists uh, are more engaged in social media and more active on social media, particularly on Twitter. We may also use so, uh, Scopus for journal profile, profile analysis. I presented here just an example of journal and latest site score information. So it's important to use Scopus, not just for searches, but also for profiling journals and regularly, some, some journals update monthly, but uh, annual updates of um, Scopus-based citation information is sufficient. We may, may use uh, search engine of Scopus to track citations uh, related to uh, journals and annual citation activity can be compared uh, when we use, let's say compare sources tool presented on Scopus platform we may analyze and uh, uh, distinguish journals with increasing or decreasing citation counts, annual citation counts and other citation-based metrics. 
So here I present one of the promising journals, Indian Journal of Rheumatology. Our keynote speakers are also affiliated to this journal and these journal citation activity is increasing. However, this journal is a, special, a specialist journal. So uh, absolute number of citations is not so high compared with top uh, journals in their field, in their subject category, rheumatology. We are not allowed to compare uh, journals be, uh, in one subject category with journals in another subject category. And always, it's a, a golden rule in uh, scientometrics and perhaps in altmetrics. We should compare journals only within one subject category. We may also uh, establish, uh, um, calculate or uh, visualize number of citations to journals before applying to Scopus. And there is option allowing us to visualize uh, our journal of interest in references of items in already indexed by Scopus. And I frequently use for journals uh, I consult and uh, before they apply to uh, Scopus. Here is one of the successful examples and I am proud of this achievement because this journal is uh, followed by me and consulted by me and by our moderator over the past five years. And this journal is already covered by Scopus, uh, Doage, PubMed Central, and you see the journal was accepted by PubMed Central in uh, 2019. And within one year, citation counts multiplied. And this is a good example for all journals uh, applying to uh, PubMed Central and uh, to, bibliographic to uh, bibliographic databases. Visibility on PubMed Central repository uh, increases citation uh, citation counts. So we may also use the same uh, Scopus database to analyze citations from other journals to understand which countries, which authors frequently cite this journal and then switch, change our editorial strategy towards countries, towards authors uh, who may be interested in this a specific journal. So Scopus is multidisciplinary bibliographic database. It's a much desirable platform for most researchers worldwide, for uh, most journal editors, regardless of their uh, academic disciplines. And I strongly encourage our today's participants to use Scopus searches for their articles, for their journals, and to visualize academic rank of their universities. So good luck to all our participants and I am at your service to help uh, increase and uh, improve or upgrade your uh, research strategies, research methodologies and journal editorial strategies. Over to you. Olena. So Olena is probably <laughs> Ah, Latika is waiting, okay. So I'm open to questions. If you have any questions, please ask. We may uh, have five minutes for our quick, for uh, to respond to quick questions. So hello, may I ask in, not in Anna. right mode? Yeah. Anna from Ivana Frankivsk. Thank you for your participation and for your yeah. respect. Yeah, so thank you. It uh, was the great first lecture. So thank you very much. But I actually I wanted to ask you about the this recognition of citation by Scopus. So in approximate time, how much it takes for this recognition by Scopus and why Scopus is so um, slow in the comparison with the Google Scholar, for example? Thanks. Thank you, Bogdana, for an excellent and pro I think it's professional question. I know that uh, you are interested in journal editing and your knowledge will be helpful to all 
uh, ongoing journals in uh, Ukraine. So Scopus compared to Google Scholar in terms of citation coverage. Of course, Scopus requires more time for bibliographic, uh, for uh, analyzing article metadata, metadata and compared to Google Scholar. Scopus, uh, uh, more aimfully uh, analyzes uh, different points, more specifically, more bibliographically. Scopus is bibliographic database and it covers uh, more valuable information, whereas valuable to researchers and journal editors and publishers. Whereas Google Scholar non-selectively processes information, automatically processes information from journal platforms. And this is why citations on Google Scholar uh, can be visualized immediately uh, uh, upon citations, whereas Scopus uh, citation coverage takes time. Thank you, Bohdana. Yeah, thanks. And I have even seen that in the Google Scholar, they have the citation of the preprint. So if it's there is the preprint, it's not uh, uh, published even online, but they have already even not reviewed, but they are already calculating the references like the citation. You are right. So you, uh, quite, you are quite right. So Google Scholar non-selectively covers all information about article uh, traffic down um, attractiveness in terms of uh, views, uh, in terms of uh, downloads. And preprints is a separate new uh, issue. Uh, preprints are servers for uh, posting non-peer-reviewed articles, rapidly developing online service. And not always preprints are up to high, st high standards. They may uh, post articles of questionable, uh, with questionable points of uh, low uh, quality. So preprints are rapidly covered by Google Scholar. Of course, Scopus also try Tries, uh, be, uh, try to cover uh, comprehensively all information about different sources and preprints are currently also considered if these preprints come from Square One or other established pre, uh, preprint server, servers with reliable quality controls. So these are in, in this sense, Scopus competes with uh, information uh, search engines in terms of coverage of preprints. But preprints are not non-reviewed sources. And I personally rare, rarely consider preprints for cite, uh, citing, preprint articles for citations. I prefer to cite peer-reviewed sources covered by Scopus, Web of Science, PubMed, not uh, not just uh, Google Scholar. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, dear Arman, uh, thank you yeah. very much for your excellent presentation. Let's move on. Uh, and uh, to Latika, uh, La yes. Yes, Latika. Yes, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Latika. Uh, she is an expert in social media and scientific journalism and she is a highly skilled author with numerous successful publications. And uh, she is also a recipient uh, of Fellowship of Postgraduate Medicine International Award for Medical Writing in Social uh, Media this year. Dr. Latika, we are really proud <laughs> of you uh, for this uh, really important internationally recognized award. Uh, you can start awesome. your presentation. Thank you, Lena, for the very kind introduction, as always. Uh, I hope I'm audible because I'm using earplugs today. It's a voice group. Am I audible to you? Uh, yes, everything is okay. Yes, yes, Latika. All right. 
So today we'll be covering Instagram for scholars. This is one of the uh, lesser explored social media platforms for academic purposes. And um, uh, just to introduce a brief background is that Instagram is a photo and video sharing social networking service. It is owned by Facebook and was launched in October 2010. And uh, the main features include uploading photos and very short videos. This is unlike most of the platforms where longer videos may be allowed or links to those can be posted while Instagram is more selective and primarily a photo sharing platform. And uh, it promotes the, encourages the users of um, user filters and uh, basically artistic traits among users and with the use of hashtags, which uh, is common vocabulary, thanks to Twitter, many of you would be aware. Um, and comments, they, it promotes engagement between uh, the users on platform. So it focuses mainly on image uploads and Instagram has in fact become the most popular photo sharing platform on the internet. And uh, it may be an attractive option for academics because uh, not just because you can take a picture or a video and post it to Instagram, but it is very easy, it is quick, it uh, looks nice and uh, for those with the aesthetic sense. And it is fun. So in fact, it's also considered to be one of the highly addictive platforms. And you can also share it on Facebook and Twitter. So uh, you can route everything through Instagram. So it's convenient. And it is tied up with Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr, in fact, three platforms. And uh, most of the users are young and primarily under the age of 35. So one can guess that they may be more likely to meet students. And uh, there's a strong recreation and emotion based on Instagram. So it can really work on intuitive learning, which is fast paced. So just to introduce you to the various learning models, there's several models being proposed, but uh, the main one that we want to talk about is sensing versus intuitive. So uh, while a sensing learner prefers to take on information that is concrete or practical, and they're oriented towards details, facts, and figures, and uh, prefer to use only procedures which have been proven. These are people who are pragmatic and uh, do not accept any kind of information, while intuitive are learners who prefer to take in information that is abstract or original and oriented towards theory. So this is a clear divide between people and how they operate. And it has also been linked to the centers of the brain, which may be more dominant in decision-making process. So they look at the big picture and they try to grasp the overall patterns. They like discovering possibilities and relationships and working with ideas. So there's a clear difference in ideology between these two category of people and also the kind of learning they would embark on. So they look at the Felder Silverman model, one of the proposed models of learning. It says that people, may have a visible shift towards a verbalizer domain where they can talk well or an imager who can just absorb images and interpret them better and retain them better or a whole is to who is in balance and analyzes both equally but the analytic who goes more towards a verbalizer domain but also takes in some facts from images so uh why we need to know this with regard to instagram is that whether you are uh, using sensory or intuitive cues or if you're using more of visual cues or if you're more of a reflective person versus an active person who interacts and manipulates objects or does physical experiments versus reflective person who likes to analyze the experiment we don't like to do the experiment but we like to think about it as i say that you will have a good think then these are the people who are, are global learners, sequential learners are who like verbal information followed by visual information in a sequence they don't like it all together while global learner would prefer holistic and systematic approach. So depending on your um, preference for learning, there might be some people out there among ourselves who uh, may learn better with a medium like Instagram. And uh, there are several learning models. We talked about one, but if you go through the others, you will realize most of them have these one particular personality trait, which will be the reflector or the intuitive Pattern. So it's definitely out there, and this is one domain which um, 
has been known for quite some time, but has not been utilized to that extent in learning and teaching. Uh, in fact, one of uh, the very good examples of this was this experiment where uh, teachers and students were separately interviewed and teachers said that they thought students would learn better from presenting representations one at a time seriously. seriously. So they wanted to teach them the concept of mitosis versus meiosis. And they thought first they will describe it in words, the definition, then they will put up a picture and then words again in that picture, and that should work better. While the students believed that they themselves would learn best from simultaneous presentations. So maybe the pictures put together or the definition with the picture or the picture followed by a prompt and then the definition comes up. And uh, in a long series of experiments in this paper, which we're not going into um, in at depth due to time limits, uh, the final result was that simultaneously presented uh, pictures of mitosis and meiosis, but only when paired with self-explanation prompts to discuss the relationship and the differences between the graphics. That was the most effective model of teaching. So uh, basically science educators would believe or may benefit from shifting their teaching belief to align with beliefs about their own and basically learn to more uh, multiple visual representations. So in short, this is somewhere in a distant way uh, related to Instagram. And as I say, a picture say more than a thousand words and uh, YouTube is already well established as a medium for learning. And uh, although it has been criticized at times because it's thought to be passive and has only videos while Instagram is active engagement and has pictures plus videos, although the videos are short, but now Instagram has introduced several other functions where you can have longer videos, which we will talk about um, over the next few slides. Um, while videos have been criticized for being passive in teaching and learning, uh, the next step is screencast. So, um, this is typically like me sharing my screen with you as we're doing now, but in a more animated manner. Like if I share my desktop and then I start drawing something. So there is a visual cue, there is an audio cue, and then there is some active engagement. And then you give me feedback as well. So these are particularly uh, good for didactic engagement and some specific scenarios, like if you want to teach someone the use of a software, or um, yeah, typically that, if there's a new freeware which you have installed and you wanna show them how to use it, then the best way is to do that. Also, uh, it feels more real life because uh, they're looking at a real desktop. And it need not just be the desktop, it could be any screen or any real life scenario, it could be a video, but then it has to have added dimension, audio plus like drawing or some sort of feedback mechanism. It's also convenient uh, rather than video recording, which is very systematic, timed, it can be also having a pause, play, pause. Like um, suppose you want to explain one particular aspect and you go over it three times. And um, yes, you can mix various tools. So this is uh, the next thing which is being proposed and coming up in a big way for learning. Although it's not there on Instagram, so we deviated a little from the topic. And coming back to it, the short videos on Instagram which are very easy to create. So ranging from just three seconds to 60 seconds. So they make life really easy for those who are not well versed with creating videos. You can even create them with your phones. And the best part for academics is suppose you're in the wards and you saw a particular movement disorder, or you saw some weird kind of pulsation or, or, or something else. It's your friend is teaching something, they're drawing something, and you just want to capture that. You can do that as a short video. So it's a good engagement tool uh, uh, with valuable information which can be captured in the simplest way. And with those filters, you can also make it look pretty and anyone can edit it to the desired aspect ratio. So um, this is a distinctive feature of Instagram, but there are various other uses. Uh, it can be stimulating in more than one different ways, like apart from uh, motivating people to improve their imagery skills because you look at all the beautiful images on Instagram. Uh, it can also motivate students to take up videography. It is proposed that intuitive learning is faster and visual cues also lead to faster learning. 
they also translate into better attention spans. And um, the ever shrinking attention spans around us to do uh, widespread social media use, uh, this may be something to look out for. And uh, it has also been proposed for language learning. So last time we had a detailed discussion about how to learn languages on Twitter. So Instagram is not very far behind. Mm, there are several accounts catering to that aspect. And uh, more importantly, it is linked to emotional aptitude because images are strongly linked to emotions. And uh, it can, educative material can also help build emotional aptitude while at the same time uh, facilitating fun-based learning. So basically you learn more in less time. And uh, on the same lines, the authors of this paper, uh, literally having the same title, a picture is worth a thousand words. They applied image-based learning to a course design. And uh, the core assignments for a group of students included discussion board image selection posting and critique exercises, a sociology experiment where the youth were, um, they wanted to teach students the meaning of youth and uh, demonstrate their comprehension of the concept and also their ability to examine it and then reflect on their own learning process. So it's a more complicated sort of uh, teaching uh, because the concept is not that simple as in sociology often it can be. Uh, it's complex in a different way from our usual scientific stuff. So. Um, the authors of this paper tried these different kind of core assignments and this led to uh, very good outcomes with students performing way better than expected um, at week seven. And uh, later a survey suggested that 97% said the course met more than uh, their expectations and 95% said that they could learn more than they ever did in any course they'd ever taken. So uh, clearly uh, uh, it can motivate um, people to um, suppose you are a novice at Instagram and you want to use it for educated purposes. So you may be motivated in some specific ways to use it or to uh, engage with educative content. One is a writing. So there is a lot of text out there which can be written below a post. So like Twitter is restrictive in that sense, there are only two ways characters and Facebook again offers a lot of um, space and allows long text and Instagram is the same. Then it promotes creative learning and photo journaling and then if you're capturing trends of any kind like suppose you're drawing a timeline of events or uh, for a particular case report or just charting any like COVID trends so these kind of things, graphs and pictures, they would do well on Instagram. Uh, since we're talking about images, um, one field is anatomy where uh, pictures are particularly important. And uh, in this paper, the authors explored uh, education relevant to anatomy on Instagram and they found 80 accounts top among the top accounts relevant to this. They picked out various search terms and uh, using hashtags, they looked for the top five to 10 accounts related to each of the hashtags and uh, they came down to 80 accounts. The most common educational content was uh, the photo of a clinical case, often taken in the operation theater with an associated description providing scientific information about the treatment and the outcome of the patient. But educative content was only five of the area accounts. So there was a lot of room there for more educative content to come up, but most of them were related to the medical field, a few related to dentistry, and six purely grass anatomy related. And some were related to both medicine and dentistry. And the kind of content which they found was a lot of before after images, there were radiographs, there was some medical humor, there some rare cases, and scans. Scans are particularly popular on Instagram, and this is something which I have observed. And then there are multiple choice questions or stories, which can uh, have written text in the form of images. So um, like all social media platforms, um, there are disadvantages with Instagram. 
like other um, SMPs, once anything is on Insta, it usually stays on Google forever. So uh, that is something worth considering if you're protective of your data and obviously patient safety rights. Um, but then we expect that consent is taken and patient identities are hidden whenever anything of that sort is shared. And the URL links are low. So one thing about Instagram is you can't really put out the URL links there. So you below the post, you can't always put out the URL link because it they cannot click it unless you have more than 10,000 followers. So you have to go to the account bio to click on the link. So unless you are an influencer there in the story, the link can be clicked directly. But uh, despite that, so that being said, a lot of people would uh, come to Instagram just for the entertainment sake or just for fun and stay there. No one really likes to move away from Instagram. But then it also helps to build the bonds, which is good for learning on the platform per se. You don't want them to go and read the entire article. They may not do that. But you can still learn on the go. There are tiny bits of learning. And... Uh, not many academicians use it currently, at least not in rheumatology as I saw. And we will look at that data together in a while. So the other unspotted issues, again, like most other social media platforms, the quality check is absent. And um, advertising may be particularly dominant on Instagram versus Twitter. So nearly one third of uh, accounts even relating to the anatomy paper they were advertising in some way. So there may be a dental clinic, they were trying to sell the services. But still a good part of Instagram is there's some education on the way, education and entertainment, and the advertisements are not usually glaring on your face. So um, I think I've answered how it scores above uh, the other social media platforms. But uh, just to... Um, push this idea in again uh, with respect to learning this tool may have uh, a lot of potential uh, like the authors of this paper explored a pharmacy practice experience course um, during fall 2018 and uh, so pharmacy students were basically uh, notified of the availability of an Instagram account which was managed by the principal investigator of the study who posted ambulatory care uh, clinical pearls as an optional supplemental tool. So the students had the option of not taking it if they didn't want. And then 69 students were exposed to this model where 37 refused to um, supplemental education tool while 32 took it up. And the pretest uh, mean scores were the same between the two groups. But later, uh, with respect to learning, the increase in mean scores was higher for the Instagram group. So it shows that probably learning was better and the use of an educational Instagram account had a great positive impact on students' knowledge relating to ambulatory care pharmacy. This is the account that was linked to the study called AmCareX. And as you can see, there were a lot of infographics which had tiny nuggets of information decorated in graphs and pictures um, in digested format for the students to absorb. And uh, now comes the great question, does my speciality have presence on, in, on Instagram? So this is something for you to look out for. Uh, I looked up rheumatology and found nearly 69 accounts and uh, thought that it may be useful for this speciality. So it may vary from, uh, um, depending on your uh, field of specialization, like for those where images or rashes or pathology or radiographs, any kind of scans. For those fields, it may be more useful where imagery is important. So for rheumatology, we are maybe interested in rashes, rare cases, scans, and physiotherapy videos. And in line with that, I found a lot of journal accounts apart from society accounts, which were, I think, the highest in number followed by clinics. So again, nearly one third was some sort of advertisement. And then uh, some uh, societies, which were basically academic communities like the Rheumatology Research Foundation. And uh, if you look at the journal posts, so this is one of the journal accounts 
where the REIT in the last two years was the highest either for um, posts which had multiple pages. So original article with digested information provided as stories which could be flipped through or images with explanations. And yes, images did seem to do better than just screenshots of articles. Of course, there are a lot of variables there because even the time of the post and day of posting can also influence the reach. Um, brief introduction to the other functions of Instagram. So apart from posts, you can also have stories which disappear within 24 hours, but can be archived um, on the account. And now they've introduced reels, which are short videos and which are really um, getting attention quickly. And in fact, Instagram also pushes reels further. So if you have, uh, if you're subscribing to academic content, you may see a lot of them. And um, there's also a live feature where suppose you're holding a short meeting and suppose a teacher and you want to reach out or if you are a researcher or, or a physician and you want to reach out to patients with a particular disease, then yes, you can just go live and then you can also interact. And in the chat, you can have live interaction with your patients or whoever the subscribers are. And IGTV, it's a standalone video application by Instagram, which is available separately as well as through Instagram. And uh, it allows for longer videos. So uh, Instagram doesn't feel crippled in that regard. And you can also have longer videos up there. So uh, just to um, emphasize this once more, visuals stick in long-term memory. And one of the easiest ways to ensure that learners store information in the long-term memory is to pair concepts with meaningful images. In fact, it is said that more than three days retention is just 10 to 20% for written material, but nearly 65% for visual information. And human beings process visual efficient information more efficiently and faster. Like, you know, this is a box and <laughs> a red box, but it could also be a plain figure with four equal straight sides and four right angles. This is clearly not an efficient way of transmitting information what this is. So it also improves comprehension, uh, like reading comprehension. Students have been shown to have greater achievement through visual um, education, educative material and organizing, communicating ideas, particularly for finding patterns and relationships. Like here, you know, it's the size here it's the size, here is the shape, here is the color, and here is the orientation. So at a glance, you can tell that what is the odd um, one out of the pattern, and this is really quick. So our brain processes um, and comprehends information much better when it's given in visual format. The other important aspect is the visual cues trigger emotion. So the brain set, is set up in a way that visual stimuli and emotional responses are easily linked. And together, these two form memories. So negative visual depictions are usually uh, they're useful for leaving strong emotional impression, but they're not recommended in academia, of course. And also abstract concepts may benefit from images. So oftentimes, course creators may use visual metaphors just to hammer the information in and to make sure that the student retains it. And uh, um, Motivation is also higher, like 40% of learners respond better to visual information than to text alone. So it also motivates them to learn better. And um, obviously the other way around, uh, it can be damaging as well because incorrect use of visuals can also deter learners. So uh, a quick example of one of the accounts which went viral overnight uh, in the United States. And uh, so this mainly discusses social issues like depression over here. It talks about depression that looks and feels different for every person. It is a personal experience. There are more than 264 million people of all ages who suffer from depression and sadness and depression are two different things. And health is available. So it's a social account for like to spread social messages. And these kind of accounts can also help uh, people connect with patients. So if you're on, out there on social media to connect with your patients, then this is another dimension to look at. 
And um, in fact, one of these interesting studies found that uh, picture-based social media platforms may um, help decrease loneliness and happiness and satisfaction levels may go up with the use of these social media platforms versus more mechanical and information-based platforms like Twitter. So, um, and they did these experiments where some uh, of those showed that people using Facebook had lower loneliness levels. And uh, this is the reason again, why uh, large patient communities may be found online. And if you're out there to connect with them, then some of these platforms may do better than the rest. That being said, uh, people are also using social media platforms to conduct research. And as we've seen in the past, YouTube and uh, Google Trends and Twitter-based studies, um, people have also analyzed hashtags on Instagram to see the kind of content that is out there and how it can improve for the patients or for educated material for, um, for other dietitians. So um, it is, Important to know that these kind of studies do not require an ethical approval. So there may be something you may want to consider at some point if there's a particular issue, particular issue that you're uh, trying to look at. And uh, if you think that all metrics is another reason that Instagram may be useful, then you may be wrong because the alt metric donor covers most of the other social media platforms, but unfortunately not Instagram yet. And um, it just limits. The other problem with Instagram is that uh, it's not browser friendly. So you can only post using your phone and not using the browser or the PC. But with a lot of hashtag use, you can, uh, your post can gain some traction and increase visibility. So there are websites. So if you just Google the best hashtags for academia, it will tell you 30 hashtags. So 30 is the maximum number of hashtags you can use for one post on Instagram and they would come up. So it's quick and it's easy. In fact, it's one of my favorite social media platforms, not for so much for academics though. So the pitfalls are not PC friendly, addictive, so far as addictive, but uh, that comes with all social media platforms, maybe more with Instagram, I don't know, you will have to look that up. But people come here for entertainment, so they may not visit links. So you may not actually end up going and it's not that you end up going and reading the entire article. But still, something is better than nothing. So you may get educated where you are and you may like to stay there. And uh, yes, technical, some technicalities may be not that comfortable, uh, like link sharing. So you may have to use another platform like Zentree to put up many links. If you are trying, if you're a teacher and you're trying to disseminate information, Story URLs only if you are a social media sensation with more than 10,000 followers. It takes a while to get there. <clears throat> and hashtags unlimited to 30. So the question is, should I use Instagram for scholarly purposes? Yes, the answer is yes. For learning, for engaging with colleagues, to engage with patients, for teaching, yes, even to conduct studies, and lastly, to have fun. <clears throat> and um, if you're using Instagram for personal use, you can keep a professional account separate. So it's easy to also switch between the various platforms, uh, various accounts, and <coughs> Instagram gives you that option. So uh, in short, Instagram has untapped academic potential and uh, <clears throat> the utility is greater for certain specialities. Distinct engagement um, may give it an edge over some other platforms. And the addition to alt metrics is, of course, something which may add value in the future. And with this, we come to my most liked image on Instagram. Thank you. Uh, dear Latika, uh, thanks for your excellent uh, and eye catching presentation. Thanks to your lecture, I have discovered many new things about Instagram uh, and definitely I will use new knowledge uh, uh, for academic purposes. <laughs> uh, 
And I'm sure that all our participants uh, will uh, open Instagram accounts uh, and will use Instagram uh, also for um, academic uh, purpose. Thank you very much. Uh, Dear colleagues, uh, we encourage uh, you um, uh, to ask uh, questions uh, to our speakers. Olena, may I ask, uh, I, I just want to comment and yes. uh, of course Please. ask a quick question. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you to Latika Gupta, who is a social media editor and also associate editor in uh, one of the best uh, index rheumatology journals, International Journal of Rheumatic Diseases. And we, of course, cooperate and uh, learn a lot uh, from uh, Latika's uh, experience, activities, and we uh, share, uh, we are co-authors in a number of articles and hopefully our cooperation will continue with numerous other publications. So uh, uh, Latika's main interests, of course, relate to, uh, in terms of social media, relates to visualization, graphics, photography. And this is why she is keen to open Instagram accounts from for rheumatology journals. Rheumatology is a field of uh, clinical science interested in uh, a number of um, clinical symptoms which can be depicted in uh, images, CT scans, and other so-called eye-catching uh, materials. So, but not all specialties need Instagram accounts to uh, promote or to disseminate their articles. Some, let's say, uh, social sciences, humanities, may be better off even without Instagram. However, is, uh, Instagram is a uh, is an essential social media account for rheumatology, dermatology, infectious diseases specialists, and these type of journals, journals pathology. in these fields. Uh, yes, yeah. pathology, of course. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and also specialists, specialists for specialists uh, collecting photographs of their patients or uh, elements uh, of uh, the, the skin elements and other materials, short videos, of course. It's one of the limitations of his Instagram, 60 seconds of video uh, clips. However, uh, like uh, Twitter is limited uh, in uh, characters to two, 280, Instagram is limited to 60 seconds of video. It's okay, it's good. There is no need to have more. Twitter is micro microblogging uh, platform, whereas Instagram is micro video platform, video and uh, audio video platform. So we may, uh, we are satisfied with uh, both social media platforms and are going to use Instagram to our rheumatology journals. Specialists in other fields may also learn more from our experience, your experience. I know that Shevchenko Scientific Society Proceedings, Medical Sciences, uh, one of the best promising journals, which is going to be covered by almost all bibliographic databases, they need to learn from your presentation how to use Instagram to promote their articles. I know that this journal publishes image articles, short uh, uh, image, particularly articles with images or supplementary materials full of images. These type of uh, these materials can be disseminated via Instagram, of course. We may also think about video articles. And for that, we need we don't need Instagram, we need YouTube as a, a platform for sharing supple video supplementary materials. We'll try to use it. And Instagram, like YouTube, like other social media platforms for uh, sharing audio, uh, video, ad, um, uh, visual and audio mater uh, video materials, these platforms are good for non-Anglophone countries where pictures, videos may uh, bring more information than textual information. So for non-anglophones, video materials, it's 
something new and they may advance, may maybe at the top level by using video articles, by sharing information on YouTube or image articles, image uh, images of uh, images, photographs on Instagram. So I encourage to diversify use of the uh, use di a diversity of social media platforms uh, in non-anglophone countries in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, and. Uh, succeed in uh, in an academic competition. So thank you for your uh, excellent informative presentation, didactic. Uh, these points will be definitely helpful for establishing Instagram accounts by Eastern European journals. Thank Maria you. Lajka, thank you. And our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Durga Misra, uh, who is a highly skilled uh, journal uh, editor, author of numerous successful publications in indexed medical journals. Uh, Dr. Durga, uh, welcome. Uh, Hello, can Dr. you hear Dr. me? Dr. Armin, welcome. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, yes, you can share your screen with us. Yes, I'm just starting to share my screen. Oh, I can see your presentation. Uh, good evening, everybody. And thank you to Dr. Olena and Dr. Arman and to the Shevchenko Scientific Society for inviting me to deliver this lecture on how to analyze top cited research, including the methodology and what are the implications of this. I do not have any disclosures. And this is how I propose to discuss this topic. What is the need for bibliometric analysis? How to analyze highly cited papers? Are simply the numbers in the analysis important or can we go beyond that? Does the database on which the analysis is undertaken matter? And what are the implications of analyzing highly cited papers? So coming to the need for bibliometric analysis, uh, as all of you know, scientific output is increasing every day and this article in Nature News covered uh, analysis which right from the 19, uh, from the 1600s up to the early 2000s, wherein it was seen that scientific output doubles approximately every nine years. Uh, please note that this graph is on a logarithmic scale and hence whatever increase would appear on a simple scale would be much more dampened here. Nevertheless, you can see there is a rapid increase, particularly in the uh, second half of the 20th century and also in the early 21st century. So with so much of increasing research output, for example, let us see a search on PubMed using rheumatoid arthritis, if you see the number of articles is gradually increasing every year. So with so much of published output, how do you know what is important? How can you separate the shaft from the grain? Bibliometric analysis helps to do that by analyzing the metrics or citation information of published articles derived from the bibliographic databases. So various metrics can be used, for example, a citation count, simple number of citations, or the average number of citations per year. A citation count, one must remember, can always be skewed to some extent by self-citations. But when we are talking of top cited publications, generally the citations number in thousands. So it is unlikely that they would be skewed by self-citations because self-citations could be 10, 20, 50, 100. But when the total number of citations is in the thousands, self-citations really would not matter so much when it comes to the top cited articles. So this was published in Nature in 2014, wherein they looked at the top 100 papers of all time based on the number of citations these papers had received on the web of science. The Web of Science was under Thomson Reuters that time, 
Now it is run by Clarivate Analytics. And this is an approximate idea of the number of citations. So they have put a scale such that these citations can be compared to the height of various known structures like the Eiffel Tower, the Burj Khalifa building, the height at which light aircraft fly, and this is Mount Kilimanjaro. So the top cited papers actually come somewhere near the peak of Mount Kilimanjaro. And as you can see, the top 10 cited papers are listed here. One thing to note is that these papers were published quite early on. These papers were published in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Only one of them, or two of them were published in the 1990s. So what does this tell us? This tells us that the number of citations that a paper gets generally increase with time. And that also holds true for top cited publications. Some notable publications they have shown here, for example, the Watson and Crick model of DNA had 5,200 publications. Uh, the discovery of the ozone hole had 1,871 publications. And I think many of you might have heard of the H index, which was proposed by a scientist from California, George Hirsch, to measure the scientific productivity. Basically, an H index tells you that you have at least H number of papers which have been cited at least H number of times. So this paper had been cited until then near about 1800 times. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, the number of articles in the higher ranks of the citations near about the top, more than 100,000 citations, there are only three articles. So the higher you go, the more sparse it becomes and it gets more populated as you come down the list. Nevertheless, having a number of citations of 40,000 is no mean feat. And any article that gets into a top 10 or a top 100 list of citations is likely to be a notable article because it has been cited, it has been referenced so many times. And it must have been referenced under so many different circumstances. So how do we analyze highly cited papers? So one could use different methods, a basic citation analysis, including the number of citations, or an in-depth analysis of citations, which in include certain complex analysis, such as the degree centrality and other measures. What is important to know is whenever you are describing a paper on highly cited papers, one must specify what were the search terms or keywords used, what were the databases searched? What were the dates of these searches? The relevance of this, one shall see in the subsequent examples that follow. How does one identify a topic for bibliometric searches? First, one can scan the literature to identify previously published papers on bibliometric searches. And you may consider embarking on citation analysis on a topic that interests you or a topic which has not been previously published, or a topic which has been previously published but has methodological issues that can be improved upon. So if one goes to the medical subject headings library, bibliometrics is the mesh term that is used to describe this kind of analysis of bibliometric databases. If you see the scope note, the use of statistical methods in the analysis of the body of literature to reveal the historical development of subject fields and patterns of authorship, publication and use. It was formerly called a statistical bibliography. Now it's, it's described as bibliometrics. So putting this search term on a PubMed search, one can see there are nearly 1300 articles in this area. So you can look up what are the articles that have been published. Are there any relevant articles that have not been published in this area? And hence, you can go and try to search that literature to identify any knowledge gaps which can be filled by a bibliometric analysis conducted by yourself. So for most of the examples, we shall be using the Web of Science database, which is an extensive database spanning different journals and specialties. 
and for the sake of this presentation i have limited myself to rheumatoid arthritis in all the different examples so when i put the search term rheumatoid arthritis on a topic search on the web of science you can see i get uh, 17430 results now how do i analyze which are the top cited results i go to the number of times cited and order them in a descending order and now you can see that these articles are now ordered in a descending order of the number of citations the highest cited paper using rheumatoid arthritis on the web of science is uh, the revised criteria for the classification of rheumatoid arthritis in 1987 which had been cited nearly 15000 times and similarly other papers we shall see a little bit in more detail subsequently now if we select the top 100 cited papers we can create a citation analysis so as you can see i have limited myself to these 100 publications these are the various years spanning these publications the h index here would obviously be 100 because there are at least 100 publications with at least 100 citations so that's the maximum h index that you can have for a collection of 100 articles the average citations per item in this list of 100 articles is 2200 so that's quite a high number of citations for the top 100 papers and similarly you can see the number of times they have been cited the number of times they have been cited without self citations as i had initially told you self citations really do not make much of a difference to the top 100 cited papers or top 10 cited papers and here you can see the difference between the sum of times cited or without self citations is hardly 122 which is nothing when it comes to a total figure of more than 220000 and similarly the citing articles with or without self citations there are similar numbers essentially if you look at this articles when they were published the sum of times cited per year obviously with time as time has gone these articles more and more articles are coming which are being cited more and more what is the reason for this because there is an expansion of the number of articles being written with time the number of articles as we had seen the number of articles that is published gets doubled approximately every nine years so let's say we are in 94 when we reach 2003 the denominator is higher so obviously the number of published articles is higher and that in part contributes to the fact that recently published articles might be more on the top cited list than older articles so if we analyze this search results we can from 1970 uh, which is uh, the limit to which many art, many journals are covered on the web of science until 2021 you can analyze the number of citations these articles have got in each and every year and for each article you get an average number of citations per year why is this important this is important because a recently published article which has say 5000 citations it was published last year but it has 5000 citations it is obviously more influential, more impactful than one of the articles which has gathered an average of 400, 500 citations over the past 20, 30 years. So that is another way of understanding the citations, normalizing it to the time duration because with time articles get cited more and more. You can normalize it to some extent by looking at the average citations per year but obviously you must need to remember that the data for 2021 is going to be highly skewed because we are hardly into the year 2021 it's just three weeks so obviously the citation numbers in this year would be lesser now we can analyze these citation results through various tools that are available on the web of science database there are two ways of visualizing these analysis by a tree map analysis, wherein in this box, the area of each square approximately 
represents the number of articles the area in relation to the total area so for example this rectangle in the medicine general internal category has the largest number of articles that is 33 and hence it has the largest box and for rheumatology which is the second highest category it has 17 articles and this is the second largest box or you could visualize it by bar charts these bar charts show you the same results medicine general internal category has the highest number followed by the rheumatology category it depends on how you want to present the information and how your readership would like to see the information and you can customize the way you present these search results or you could simply download the results and create your own graphs as well which is something that is probably preferable now let's see the example of a web, web of science bibliometric analysis on rheumatoid arthritis i can now order these search results based on various categories so let us see web of science categories as we have already seen there is this medicine general internal which has the highest number followed by rheumatology and articles related to endocrinology and metabolism in relation to rheumatoid arthritis are the lowest in the top cited papers there are three articles in this area similarly by publication year by publication year for these articles you can limit the number of results that you can see to 10 if you limit it to 10 then it shows you the 10 most recent years so as you can see here in the 10 most recent years most of these top cited articles were published in 2013 and similarly you can customize this result to various numbers or you could download the data and play with it and present it whichever way you want to document types this categorizes articles as original articles or review articles or book chapters or proceedings papers uh, as you can see that an article may be included in different categories the same article may be included in different categories because we have a total of uh, 100 articles but this total number is 105 for the uh, document types so the majority of these top cited articles were original articles followed by review articles in a distribution of approximately 2/3 and 1/3 organization enhanced sorry organization enhanced helps you identify which was the organization that published this article the authors that published this article were based in which organization or university or college so here you can see that the top number 15 articles of the top 100 article top 100 cited articles come from the university of california 14 from harvard university and various other universities most of these universities as you would recognize are universities of international repute and hence it's not surprising that research output resulting in the top 100 articles in this specialty are from these universities you could also categorize such as by funding agencies to identify which are the major funding agencies that have funded these top 100 cited articles similarly you could do it for authors you could identify authors who are prevalent on this top 100 cited list and here again the number of results is limited to 10 you could you could download the data and play with it and identify who are the key authors on these top 100 list or you could look at source titles the titles of journals not surprisingly the new england journal of medicine has 19 articles amongst the top 100 cited articles in rheumatoid arthritis followed by arthritis and rheumatism which was published by the uh, american college of rheumatology followed by nature and all of these are very good reputed journals as you can see and it's not surprising that the top 100 cited articles a large number of them have been in these journals book series titles there could be series of books for example the annual review of immunology series 
this is the only result that comes up in this book series titles it is just two have been published two of the top 100 cited articles have been published under this meeting titles if there are any conference abstracts that come in the top 100 list which conferences they were published in you can analyze that similarly countries and regions a huge number of these top 100 cited articles nearly 3 fourths are from the united states of america and nearly one fourth is from the from england and you can see these are various other european countries uh, and also canada not surprisingly because a lot of good research is conducted in these regions of the world then you can look at group authors you can look at editors if editors are specifically mentioned you can look at author groups that is for example you may have uh, study groups for example the anti tumor necrosis factor trial or american college of rheumatology may be a study group the caspar study group the classification criteria for psoriatic arthritis and so on and so forth these different study groups as you can see that mostly there have been one paper attributed to each study group that have been listed in these papers and languages not surprisingly all these articles are in english because english is the commonest language used in scientific communication across the world for communicating information either relevant to patient care or translational information relevant to research that may benefit patients in the future again there is another classification of subject area it's more or less the same as the first category of web of science categories and there's also grant number grant numbers if mentioned in the articles may have resulted in a larger number of top cited papers for example you can see these grants have resulted in 3 and 2 top cited papers respectively and these are uh, institutions again you can see the top institutions that have been affiliated with these top cited papers and helps you identify global leaders in the field so can we just go beyond the mere numbers or is citation analysis simply a number game that this many articles average number of citations this many authors this many institutions can we go beyond that there are certain additional tools that help you do this for example this was a publication in 2020 on top cited papers in bronchoscopy what the authors have done is a degree of centrality analysis based on the keywords that these articles have used so here they can you can see that a large number of nodes are focused on bronchoalveolar lavage biopsy diagnosis so these are the common nodes so they have analyzed separately in the 1990s and in the 2000s and these nodes bal biopsy outcome bacteriology these some of these nodes remain similar and therefore they have concluded that the research focus or the highly attractive research that has been conducted in this specialty in the 90s and 2000s have been similar related to diagnosis of uh, the diagnostic role of bronchoscopy now does the database that you are searching make a difference as an example we have already seen the searches on rheumatoid arthritis in the web of science and to recollect we had nearly 174000 citations and uh, just to go back let's see the top 3 cited papers the 80s 1987 revised criteria for classification of rheumatoid arthritis free radicals and antioxidants in normal physiological function genome wide association study of uh, seven common diseases uh, so these are the three top cited papers as per web of science let's say we do a scopus search on this searching abstract title keywords we get 202000 results now 
200-2000 results is approximately 15% more than the number of results that we had got on the web of science. So now we can order these items by the number of citations in descending order. And as you can see, the top cited articles remain the same, but the number of citations that they have garnered is different. If you remember, the top cited article in rheumatoid arthritis on the Web of Science database had 1,500 citations. Here it has 15,000 citations on the Web of Science and 17,600 citations on Scopus. So obviously, each database will give you different results. The top cited papers may even differ with respect to database. So it is important to specify which database you are searching when you are conducting a top cited search. Similarly, just to compare, if you put rheumatoid arthritis on PubMed, you get nearly 150,000 citations. PubMed does not allow you to conduct a citation analysis. It is not advanced in that nature. So citation analysis generally have been conducted on Web of Science in the published literature and also some of them on Scopus. So it is important to specify the database that is conducted so that people can reproduce your results. And since citation numbers vary, the diversity of databases vary. Scopus is considered as the most diverse, followed by the Web of Science, followed by Medline, which is of the three reputed databases that is actually the least diverse database. What are the implications of analyzing highly cited papers? Why should I read an article which says top 100 cited papers in this or that? Is it just another paper or does it have a relevance beyond just mere numbers? So there could be various implications. When you're teaching students about important articles in the specialty topic, the top 100 articles is a good way of introducing the topic. It may help organize curricula to incorporate compulsory reading of highly cited papers and help identify landmark articles in the specialty. For example, let us look at the top 20 cited papers in rheumatoid arthritis. This is taken from a list of top 100 cited papers published in Medicine Journal in 2019. So if you see the articles that are included in this list are the 1987 classification criteria, then the role of TAS-28 score, GI toxicity of NSAIDs, articles related to therapeutics, 2010 classification criteria, and improvement criteria, criteria for defining improvement in rheumatoid arthritis, articles discussing pathogenesis, role of cytokines, and so on and so forth. So you can see that a lot of these areas, if somebody goes back and reads these 20 different articles, they get a good idea of how the historical perspective of how literature on rheumatoid arthritis has evolved over the decades. And for beginners, let's say somebody is starting to learn rheumatology, if they are prescribed that they should read these top 20 articles, they will get a good idea of the literature regarding rheumatoid arthritis, the basic pathogenic aspects to start with. So it helps them identify that these are important areas with respect to therapy, with respect to uh, understanding the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. Other implications could be to identify avenues for further research. For example, classification criteria might need revision and newer papers related to such revisions are likely to become highly cited. So if there are highly cited classification criteria, then it may be something worthwhile to work on if there is a need to develop a further classification criteria in that disease. Similarly, tools for disease assessment and diagnosis are also likely to be cited more. Let's see these top 20 cited papers in rheumatoid arthritis once again. You can see the classification criteria 1987-2010, definition of improvement, tools to assess disease activity, 
these are all in the list of highly cited papers it helps recognize leading countries and or centers for research in a particular disease motivate researchers to gain experience working at such centers and may help underlie future research collaborations rheumatoid arthritis is a common disease research on rheumatoid arthritis is conducted in practically every country so this may not be relevant for that but let's take the example of a rare disease adrenoleukodystrophy so if i do a top 100 cited search on the web of science i find that the university of minnesota has 10 of these top 100 cited papers and the university of amsterdam has 8 i can identify which are the various large centers for example boston children's hospital dana farber cancer institute in some from france university of california los angeles harvard medical school so these are centers where people are working and have published impactful research on adrenoleukodystrophy and if i am a young researcher who is looking to do a phd or a postdoc on adrenoleukodystrophy i could target these institutions because they have already published meaningful work that has been highly cited in this region so that's a good way of uh, identifying where you can conduct research particularly in areas that are not very common or not very widely studied and of course identifying change in trends in research for example using techniques such as degree centrality analysis as we had looked at the example in concoscopy understanding the reasons for such trends might enable better understanding of the subject per se so as you can see that the trends have been to study the role of bronchoscopy in diagnosis and this has not changed in the 90s and the 2000s so similarly if any change has occurred for example ebus is one of the nodes that has come up in the 2000s this is because ebus as a technique came into vogue in the early 2000s and therefore people started uh, ebus stands for endobronchial ultrasound people started looking for ebus as a bronchoscopic tool more and more in the 2000s and these papers were highly cited so that's that's an exciting area of research so to conclude bibliometric analysis helps identify prestigious and influential papers in the specialty area it can aid learning help identify avenues for further research and one can conduct basic as well as in depth analysis thank you questions are most welcome Dear Durga, thank you very much. Very informative and uh, didactic presentation for researchers, and to some extent also to journal editors. So, uh, I just wanted briefly to comment on your presentation. You discussed Nature article playing with uh, classical articles, historic articles with uh, thousands of citations, and they compared. Uh, article of uh, Crick and Watson with an article of Jörg Hirsch, Hirsch Index article. That's acceptable for nature, but for our participants, it's unacceptable to compare articles in different subject categories or uh, different academic disciplines. So what's acceptable to nature, that's unacceptable to regular regular journal editors and researchers so they should focus on their field of interest let's say on rheumatology or specifically on rheumatoid arthritis your example nice example and uh, very uh, useful because rheumatoid arthritis attracts a lot of citations and rheumatology field itself is rapidly developing attracting a lot of citations so we can work uh, in this field whereas in fields of let's say humanities citations means uh, mean uh, nothing for hu humanity or arts and humanity specialists they are limited they cannot use bi uh, bibliometrics for uh, showing for visualizing trends but most other specialists uh, rheumatologists cardiologists infectious diseases specialists virologists can uh, 
visualize trends. And you were also quite right that uh, we need to normalize all these citation counts to time because with time, number of citations uh, attracted to specific articles or specific fields of science increase. So we should be very careful with um, uh, time normalization. The same refers to Twitter tweets, Facebook mentions and altmetric analysis. We should be specific and both scientometric analysis or top 100 uh, cited classics Altmet altmetric analysis should be performed as cross-sectional analysis within one day, within few or two days, because uh, within next few days, citations and uh, social media attention changes. So we should be very specific when, and we should report in 100, uh, top 100 citation uh, articles or altmetric analysis, we should always mention when exactly the analysis was performed. So another point uh, referred to Web of Science as a preferable database for some, particularly to uh, American scientists. Uh, I don't think that European specialists are happy with Web of Science analysis. Uh, they are more happier with Scopus database and Scopus uh, tools. I also use Scopus and I am satisfied. Of course, both databases are prestigious, but Scopus is uh, more advanced in terms of integration with social media uh, aggregator, Plum Analytics, whereas so Web of Science core collection platform uh, databases are not integrated and there are no plans to uh, cover social media attention or Web of Science Core Collection databases. Also, there is one important point. When we, you search through Web of Science, uh, Web of Science platform allows you to retrieve articles from uh, reputable databases like uh, Science Citation Index Expanded and Social Science Citation Expanded. And at the same time, articles come from Emerging Sources Citation Index. That database, established in 2015, not so prestigious compared to traditional old databases of Web of Science. So that is a source of bias, publication bias. We can retrieve articles, heterogeneous articles from Web of Science platform uh, from different journals. Emerging Sources Citation Index covers also rubbish journals predatory journals or journals without peer review. So we should be very careful with uh, peer review items. In that sense, Scopus is uh, help us to retrieve more homogeneous collection of articles. Uh, standards of uh, Scopus are similar for all journals. And uh, I think that Scopus to some extent is uh, more reliable than Web of Science in terms of uh, number of journals covered, in terms of homogeneity of retrieved articles. And this is why I prefer to use Scopus for uh, bibliometric searches, not Web of Science. But I know that American and Chinese specialists prefer Web of Science and uh, Chinese specialists often use Web of Science for meta-analysis, systematic reviews with meta-analysis and often ignore so, uh, searches through Scopus. So we should pay attention to differences. You were right uh, to, uh, in this bibliographic databases. And we should also try to combine searches via uh, bibliometric platform, platforms allowing bibliometric searches and altmetric searches. And if we uh, master uh, searches through bibliometric and altmetric platforms, we may produce great articles publishable by good journals, particularly in the time of pandemic. So thank you very much, Durga. Uh, dear Durga, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have one question from our participants. Uh, it's mm -hmm. well known 
that uh, to be the best, uh, cite the best. Uh, however, uh, citation accumulations uh, takes a lot of time. Uh, does it mean that uh, these uh, highly cited articles are outdated and we uh, cannot use uh, so many highly cited articles uh, in our uh, literature review, for example? Uh, I so agree it... that a large number of these articles might might appear to be outdated, but actually they are not outdated. These are actually classic articles in the specialty. Mm -hmm. To get a perspective of a specialty when you're starting out, it's always a good idea to get a historical perspective. And these bibliometric searches are likely to be able to provide you a historical perspective of how the science in this particular area evolved. So I wouldn't say that these classic articles, historical articles are outdated. For example, the 1987 classification criteria for rheumatoid arthritis, which was the highest cited paper. I wouldn't think this is outdated even today, despite the 2010 classification criteria coming in, because the 2010 classification criteria is also one of the top cited papers. And it will remain, these classification criteria are classic classification criteria for any disease, let alone rheumatoid arthritis. And these would remain relevant even say 50 years down the line. So I would be hesitant to label these, some of these articles as possibly outdated. These are actually classic articles that everybody in the specialty should know about. Uh, Durga, there is also a uh, question about why 100, why not 200, why not 50? So these numbers are established empirically by experts of bibliometrics. So in some disciplines, specialists may limit their searches of uh, top cited, and you were oh, you also mentioned that point, to not just 200, to, not just to 100 citations, 100 articles top top 100 cited articles, but also to 50 or even 20. It depends on speciality. Exactly. Yeah, and no need to worry about self citations when you process uh, uh, citation, when you work with the uh, citation analysis, because uh, these are relatively reliable data coming from a variety of uh, peer reviewed or good journals reliable journals. Uh, this is why we may ignore self-citations. And again, your one of your slides also explicitly showed that self-citations uh, for the top 100 cited articles analysis are limited. So there is no any uh, limitation for this type of research. And for, of course, Top 100 articles are important for education, for lectures, but also PhD candidates may learn a lot which articles are covered more by citations, attracted a lot of citations. In the era of evidence-based medicine, uh, highly cited articles reflective of level of evidence. Uh, so my question is to, do, uh, to you, Durga, is there any difference in terms of citations between article types or among different articles? Let's say uh, reviews, original research papers, practice guidelines. Generally, uh, uh, review articles are cited more. But as we can see in this limited analysis of articles, top cited articles in rheumatoid arthritis, original articles were actually more than the number of review articles amongst the top cited articles. But on, on an average, review articles are generally cited more. And that's the reason why citation-based metrics like the general impact factor are higher for uh, review journals, let's say Nature Reviews Rheumatology, than for say original journals like uh, Rheumatology Oxford or some other journal. So. Uh, but I think when it comes to the top cited papers, original articles might get a precedence, particularly classification criteria, treatment guidelines. Uh, these sort of articles are likely to be cited more. I think an extreme example of this 
uh, is also cited as a limitation of the general impact factor, wherein the journal Acta Crystallographica Metallurgica uh, had a hike in its general impact factor from two to I think 49 in one particular year, simply based on one article which had thousands of citations because it was a method paper. And the, since the general impact factor takes into account uh, various things, but generally a two year window, two years later, the impact factor for the journal came back to below two. So yes, method articles, articles uh, discussing classification criteria, articles discussing management guidelines are likely to be more cited. Okay, thank you, Durga. I usually okay. expect to see top cited articles, article types, such as uh, randomized control trials, systematic reviews, Cochrane systematic reviews, and also practice guidelines. To me, it was a bit surprising that rheumatoid arthritis articles, that uh, top 100 uh, cited articles uh, did not include practice guidelines. That was rather strange. But probably it depends also on citation uh, patterns. I, yes, I, I think that's an interesting point. Uh, well, am well, I audible? I think my internet connection is a little bit. Iffy. No, that's fine. We can see. We can see and we can hear you properly. Um, the same question uh, yeah. uh, from uh, Natalia Echmer. How to use highly cited uh, all old articles if we have time limit five, seven years, if they are not classical? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, why uh, the we have question a is, limit? we are usually advised to cite articles within five, seven years. Okay. But okay. why we should uh, why we should be interested in top hundred cited articles? Well, the general principle of not citing articles beyond a period of seven to ten years does not apply to classic articles. Let's say if I'm working on tachyosuartritis, it is impossible for me to write a paper on tachyosuartritis, an original article without referring to the 1990 classification criteria proposed by the American College of Rheumatology that I'm sure would be one of the top cited articles in tachyosuartritis specialty. So one must refer to classical papers. Of course, one must limit old citations such that they are not too much. And generally, one would prefer to cite classical articles but or landmark articles, but not beyond that if they are older than a seven to 10 year limit. I hope that uh, clarifies the point. Hopefully. Uh, of course, instructions for authors in uh, journals should be more liberal. Of course, we know we have to cite recent articles within five, five, seven years. But there are some disciplines, sociology, arts and humanities, or slowly developing disciplines where that limit can be extended to 10 years, 20 years, or even without any time limit. So our journal editor should be more flexible, should upgrade their instructions and try to avoid any manipulative uh, instructions about citations, because I know some uh, ongoing journals, uh, instructions of new uh, or startup journals, uh, ask their authors to expand list of references or limit number of uh, references in uh, original research papers, uh, review articles. There are logical limits of references. There is no limits to time, no limits to type of articles. So skilled authors know how to how many articles in their reference list to list the uh, references and how to properly uh, edit and have informative uh, influential reference list even without sticking to their instructions five, seven years. In pharmacy, pharmacology, chemistry, that time limit can be even two years, one, two years. Let's say newly developed uh, antiplatelet uh, agents uh, can uh, require references within one, two, three years. It depends on discipline. Uh, well, now everything is clear. 
Thank you. To you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Armin, Dr. Olina. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, who would like to add something uh, to our discussion? Uh, probably uh, Professor Luncino. Would you like to say something? I'm learning quite a bit more than I can give. <laughs> this is really very, very informative. In this new... uh, but we cannot see you. We cannot see you. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Now? Okay. Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> Yes, I mean, uh, this is really fantastic to be um, uh, listening to these experts, uh, the young experts in this new world of um, uh, bibliometrics and computer and Instagram and social media. Uh, uh, so it's, it's really, really remarkable and good for our young scientists to be um, um, apprised of this and, and know which direction to take. Uh, my only uh, additional comment would be to uh, to our men's um, early first uh, first lecture about databases and uh, about Google Scholar. I agree that Google Scholar is not a good database to use as such. However, I think we should keep it um, available and and uh, let our scholars know that it's a good source to obtain. Um, the articles themselves. I mean, you not everything, but there are a lot of things that the Google Scholar can pick up that when you're doing your research and, and you may be limited in your capabilities of access to uh, various internet uh, sources that the Google Scholar um, can be useful to obtain these materials on hand, the PDFs and, and, and the like, or even, even the abstracts themselves. You can always find an abstract. Uh, so, so that I think that should be in our armamentarium of research is that uh, you know how do we how do we gain access to this because not everyone I mean those in in the West uh, or those at universities that have access you know via their libraries uh, it's not a problem but but there are those that may may be limited and so therefore you know keep that in mind. That's a great point. Yes, I agree with you. And I think that Google Scholar is a basic search engine for all clinicians, for all uh, researchers. They start the searches. They, there is even uh, an understanding of Google diagnostics or Google therapy. Physicians use Google searches on, on a daily basis and uh, are satisfied with that search engine. However, we are, our uh, life is uh, getting more sophisticated, more complicated, and we need more professional, more advanced databases like Scopus. I hope that all our clinicians, researchers uh, will become reviewers of Elsevier uh, journals and as a token of uh, acknowledgement, they will receive access to Scopus, like uh, I have that uh, individual access for more than 15 years. So it's okay. And uh, I think that even in developing countries or in countries where uh, with uh, limited resources, access to databases is possible nowadays to so proprietary databases. Scopus is well advanced database, Web of Science also well advanced database allowing uh, advanced searches for systematic reviews for uh, good quality articles and without these databases publishing good articles is almost impossible. Um, even uh, journal editors need a lot of you need access to different databases for their editorial for developing their editorial strategies and also a number of software to uh, improve quality of uh, peer review uh, language editing, copy editing without software, just manually uh, editing uh, processed article, professed, processed uh, manuscripts, it's, it's almost impossible nowadays. So thank you to all our uh, specialists, commentators. We will continue discussing uh, uh, the uh, topics related to bibliometrics and altmetrics. So Olena, any other comments? Continuation of our discussion, we are open. Still, our uh, Dr. Durga is available. We may also ask him questions. Uh, now we have only uh, 11 uh, participants. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, dear colleagues, uh, we encourage you to ask uh, questions uh, to Dr. Durga, uh, to Dr. Arman, uh, please. Uh, Svetoslav uh, Georgiev uh, is with us. Uh, so, uh, so, would you like to say something? <laughs> Uh, it doesn't matter how many participants we have at the moment. I know that uh, some of our participants may watch uh, yes. the uh, presentations offline and then uh, contact, contact us and ask questions. Today, we discussed uh, relatively new topics for, to, uh, for our researchers. And, you know, we discussed uh, the same topics in, in another way for PhD candidates. You, uh, uh, you do a lot for PhD candidates and you know how uh, these topics are important for improving uh, novelty and enrich PhD uh, dissertations with a new di direction in, in research, not just clinical, but also just research. So these type of instruments for bibliometric and automatic analysis are important particularly in the time of pandemic when citations and social media uh, uh, attention competing with each other. So it's unprecedented competition. Uh, a number of citations to articles on COVID-19 increasing on, a, on an hourly and daily basis. So it's unprecedented. We live in an uh, in an interesting time, in interesting times. And these, uh, these both directions of research, bibliometric and automatic are important. We should embrace these analysis and incorporate in our clinical research. I am grateful to Dr. Durga. I know how we started our cooperation uh, many years ago. We just discussed science editing uh, issues and I know that um, our cooperation resulted in better uh, quality articles in uh, local Indian journals like uh, Indian Journal of Rheumatology, but also I learned a lot from uh, Durga, from Latika, from you in terms of re research, in terms of importance of different types of research, social media uh, studies, social media articles, particularly in non-anglophone uh, countries where we can use social media to promote, to disseminate uh, picture-based materials and uh, add just explanatory texts, your short explanatory texts. So these type of tricks and tips are important for our non-anglophone researchers, journal editors. So we may also learn a lot from Indian Journal of Rheumatology, which is a journal uh, edited by uh, Dr. Durga and colleagues and they improved their indexing over the past few years. Uh, they became uh, very, oh, sorry. Uh, they improved their journal and now they are going to become a bi-monthly journal with uh, a number of articles, high quality articles. Hopefully they will also get impact factor journal impact. So thank you for your attention. Over to you, Elena. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Durga, Dr. Arman. Uh, who would like to add something? Uh, uh, Oksana Stanislavivna. Шановні колеги, так, перехожу на українську мову, мабуть, всі вже пішли вечеряти, адже сьогодні напередодні водохреща, так, друга свята вечеря, або по-іншому вона називається «Голодна куття». Так, і наш вебінар плавно перейшов, так, у святу вечерю, адже для українців дуже важливо підтримувати наші національні українські традиції. Бажаємо всі, всім смачної куті. Ми так уже святкуємо сьогодні. Дякую, професор Лунчина. Дякую. Олена, we have uh, newcomers. 
uh, to our uh, webinar. So perhaps few words ab uh, about them, about their interests. I know that we have participants, most participants today are from uh, Ukraine and Bulgaria. Uh, some are, few are from Kazakhstan, but also we have some journal editors as well. Perhaps you need to discuss uh, their interests and how they are going to use today's points in their uh, daily editorial practice. Uh, yes, um, uh, these journals editors uh, were with us, but now I cannot see uh, them among our participants. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Except so, Oksana Zaishkivska, yes. Yeah, so of course, yeah, uh, the flagship journal in Western uh, and uh, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, Proceedings of uh, Shevchenko Scientific Society. So today's points are important, not just to researchers, but also to editors. All Eastern European non-anglophone journals may improve their visibility and indexability uh, by performing regular uh, bibliometric and altmetric analysis. I showed one of tools to uh, visualize and follow how many citations go to your journal. Without citations, it's impossible to get indexed by uh, citation databases such as Web of Science, particularly Science Citation Index Expanded and get impact factor. So today's presentations, messages on bibliometric analysis, uh, altmetric analysis are important for quality of non-anglophone journals. They may continue improving uh, um, their promotion activities to attract a lot of citations, social media attention, but they also need to publish attractive articles or video articles with short explanatory English text. These type of points are practical. Hopefully they will enforce in their editorial strategies. So thank you to all our participants, keynote speakers for their time uh, donation and also for their uh, expert uh, advice to our researchers and journal editors. We wish all them luck and hope to see them again during our future. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to all our regular contributors, speaker, participants, uh, new participants. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, have a good uh, evening uh, and see you soon. Goodbye.